All right, so we're going to get take a take a shot at um, continuing the conversation. You know, we had these three videos that talked about governance, and as we kind of were building up that AI or LLM started moving into that more, and then you know you went rogue and produced this you know, super deep uh, consideration of of the sort of the AI problematic, and I think we're going to continue that. We're going to kind of reference from there. Sure. Uh, it's mm -hmm. certainly my perspective, which is I don't, you know, it's worth something, but not much, that you have articulated the sort of the richest and deepest uh, perspective on sort of LLM slash AI uh, to date. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I would say sort of it's th th about this, I have a deep con uh, conviction, which is that the current conversation around that space is maybe about 12% as robust, like as holistic, as rich as it needs to be. And you were bringing, you know, a probably, you know, up to say 80%, like you're adding a tremendously larger mm. uh, space of perspective. And that by itself is ju just even saying, Hey guys, we need to be thinking about these kinds of things, not just this narrow thing um, is helpful. But I'm wondering what's the, and you've, you've obviously now been living in the aftermath of that. I'm wondering, like, what's the richest place for us to focus our attention for the next 50 minutes? Um, I don't know. I mean, there's been two really good response videos. I had one with Ryan, uh, which, which was a uh, philosophical, theological response from a Christian perspective to the proposal. And then there was one with Johannes and Sean, which was very much uh, a deep, uh, philosophical reflection from sort of a continental philosophy, philosophy of technology kind of perspective. Mm. Uh, and so the first thing I want to say is, um, uh, and I have one more that I haven't published with Chloe, Chloe Valdery, that is going to come out on my channel as well. Interesting. Okay. Um, uh, and that's been more, that was video was more, she wanted to zero in on the, uh, the sort of the AI proposal I made and the, um, there was a clip from one of my Q and A's where I got sort of very passionate um, uh, um, many people said they've never seen me that emotional about sort of the Moloch side of the problem. Yeah. She wanted to zero in on that. And, um, and, um, I, I was sort of discussing the hopes and fears I had before, um, all of this landed and how the, the hopes, um, were not, uh, fulfilled and the fears were largely, uh, realized. Um, I, my hope to put it in a nutshell had been that the advances in AI would be science-driven, they would be knowledge-driven, and that, that that science project would be wedded to a wisdom project and a meaning project. And I had tried to argue for that, exemplify it, afford it. I uh -huh. really tried to push. And my fear was that somebody would hack their way into um, uh, AGI um, <clears throat> without there being much scientific advance and without it being in any way tethered to the, the general problems of meaning and wisdom. Um, and that and that fear largely came to pass. Yeah. Um, and so that's what uh, Zoe wanted to, uh, sorry, Chloe wanted to uh, zero in on. Um, so what what why am I what I'm saying is I've been um, bouncing off many dimensions of the talk, um, and I'm really open to wherever you think uh, it might be good to go. Um, I I guess it, 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 if if I had to say what my inclination is. Um, I, I've reached out to Jonathan and I hope to talk to him, Jonathan Pajot, and I know that you just did about all yeah. of this. And I'm I'm very interested to see the philosophical religious response to this. Um, but maybe I could take this opportunity to say a couple things first that sure. I want to be clear about, if that's fine. Um, so uh, a couple of responses that I find are not helpful um, and I'd like to try and respectfully um, present why I think they're not helpful. One response is they're just tools. Um, and this response is largely to sort of try to calm everybody down. And I find this response is running off an equivocation that's very problematic. The first is the sense of a tool the way a tractor is a tool and a tractor is not an agent. And then the distinction is therefore between a tool and an agent, and agents have certain 
capacities and we have certain responsibilities towards them uh, that we don't have towards tools. And I, that's, I think, what's intended. Uh, but of course, that's the if that's the issue, then these machines fail that distinction because they're already showing that they are becoming agents as opposed to just tools. They can determine the consequences of their behavior, alter the behavior to bring about different consequences. Yes, they're working on behest of Russ right now, but we're already giving them more and more autonomy. So um, the, 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 the attempt to say, we don't have to worry, this is just a technology and human beings have always adapted to new technologies, um, I think is, uh, is a mistake because if you mean by a tool, not an agent, then these machines are not tools. Um, and then what usually happens is that leads over into a second equivocation, which is they're just machines. Um, and there's two sides of this response is, well, you, you know, you're getting emotionally attached to a machine and you shouldn't, and people will never really do that. Uh, first of all, that's just factually false. People are extremely emotionally attached to, to their smartphones. There have been several acts of violence committed just because people have had their smartphone physically removed from them. Um, and people are already forming parasocial relationships with the GBT machines. Um, so I think the, the, the claim that nobody would be emotionally attached um, because they're just machines, I think is uh, not, uh, uh, not that reasonable. The other idea is that they're machines in a way in which we are not machines. And then um, this is the problem with that response. In one sense, they mean we're, they're machines because they're not agents, they don't have intelligence, et cetera. And in that case, it's, it's really, but that's the point. They are getting those things and we need to make decisions now before they get those things. And then the other one is, in another sense, you and I are machines. We are biological machines. And what we mean by machines are things that could be understood in terms of physical interactions uh, that reliably bring about certain functions, et cetera. And then the concern there is that, oh, but we're living things. Yes, and I clearly made it clear that I was talking about in the future autopoetic machines that have autonomy and agency. Um, and then, I think what is behind it after you push it all the way to here is what I call the secret sauce argument. Uh, human beings have a secret sauce, uh, some metaphysical property that could never be possessed by anything else. Um, and therefore um, it's impossible for these machines uh, to ever have the characteristics. Um, my response to that is that needs an independent argument. That's an argument for dualism. The attempts to establish metaphysical dualism has many, I think it's an overwhelming consensus in the philosophical and scientific community that that's a bankrupt project. I argue that it is such, uh, that you can't actually generate uh, such an argument. And lastly, it gets you into a weird place because if that secret sauce is something distinct from my intelligence, my consciousness, my agency, my personhood, I don't care about it. And I don't know why anybody should, because uh, it, do it doesn't seem to belong to or be a property of anything that uh, obligates you to give me moral concern. Mm. Um, so I, I just want to say up front that all of those moves, um, which are quite prevalent and understandably so, I would ask people to think very carefully about um, the equivocations. Your equivocation, you're equivocating on different notions of tool, different notions of machine, and uh, different notions of why we give people moral regard. Um, and if it comes down to that you are ultimately asserting a secret sauce uh, proposal, then you need to do something that has not been successfully done since Descartes, uh, which is to provide a coherent uh, defense of metaphysical dualism, which I think um, is that if you do that, forget about the Forget about critiquing John Verveke's videos. Forget about doing anything else. If you could do that, do that. Because that would be an earth shattering, philosophical, scientific right, result if you could do that. So do that. And if you can't do that, then please don't just assert the secret sauce argument to me. So that's a request. <laughs> so that's how, I'd like to, that's how I'd like to end it. All right, that, I think I, that, that by itself, uh, hopefully get some, you know, obviously I'll, I'll just be posting this on my YouTube channel, but that's a very useful, uh, that was a good use of time. Okay. 
Uh, and just as a quick recapitulation, so one, um, the, the, the equivocation around the, the, the concept of, of tool versus agent. Um, yeah. Let's just say check. Yes, I, I sort of, I consider it to be such, such an obviously true statement that I don't even feel like we need to spend any time on it. Uh, two, um, the notion of the distinction between say like emotional attachment to machines, uh, again, check. And, and here I'll actually bring in our friend, uh, Marshall McLuhan, right? He made very, very clear the fact, in, 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 at least to me, the fact that um, our minds don't actually make that kind of a distinction. You know, yeah. As far as my mind is concerned, uh, the, the fact that my fingers are part of me is as absurd as the fact that my eyeglasses are part of me. Right? There's a, there's a, <laughs> yeah. a uh, an envelope of affect that is available. And if that envelope of affect is perceived as being part of continuity of self, that is being perceived as part of continuity of self. And if you uh, scratch my car or you hit my car while I'm driving, I will say you hit me. Um, and I think that's demonstrable with oodles of evidence from a variety of different disciplines. So again, check. Now we're going to get to the third. And the third, I'm like, okay. So it sounds like what we're going to be doing is we're going to be talking about John's soul. Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, when I, when I was talking with Paggio, uh, in fact, the reason why I actually reached out to him was I was like, you know, I think we're kind of moving into the space where the kind of the great synthesis of of the, the sort of the human disciplines that has been is necessitated by the magnitude of what we're dealing with is finally beginning to bring theology back into you know, the conversation. Um, and, I, and obviously, theology has been part of its own conversation, but the point is it hasn't been part of sort of the the, well, frankly, the conversations that I've been part of and uh, yeah. certainly conversations that almost everybody working in science and technology has been part of for the past 50 years or so. All right. So that's a very interesting, and by the way, I, I don't know that you and I over the next 40 minutes are going to be able to dispense with this, this mandate of either categorically proving or disproving uh, dualism, nor do I even know that that's the problem that I'm attempting to address. Uh, mm -hmm. I would propose something like, well, I actually am proposing an inquiry and the inquiry is, is is sort of it comes from two different directions simultaneously and i think it actually grounds in something like right action ultimately mm -hmm. <clears throat> let me like kind of build my argument from a from a from a different location please, please. you let you gave me patience to lay out a quick uh, argument so i'll return the favor um so i've got on on the and, and by the way this was so this this, this came out of my conversation with Jonathan Pagius. For those of you who are like, I don't know the temporality on this is very different, but we had sort of had an extended conversation about this particular kind of example. Uh, on the one hand, I have uh, uh, an individual, a, a gentleman who's uh, deeply, deeply attached to his Ferrari. Right? So he's retired, he you know polishes it, he looks at it, he drives around on sunny days, like it's become part of his identity. And I'm going to propose for the moment that, that I'm going to characterize that as something of a... Uh, uh, there's an addiction or there's something non-fully adaptive to this thing. There's an attachment level there that is psychologically un and spiritually unhealthy. Okay, now over here, I'm going to have a, let's go with like a, a, a grandson, father, grandfather lineage that have been dedicating their lives to the construction of a cathedral. So in some sense, there's a little bit of comparability. Right? In, in some sense, yes. people yes. who are extending tremendous levels of care to objects, Right, to material objects in the world. And I'm proposing, and I feel comfortable proposing it, that my sort of my my cathedral lineage is doing something which is is not just healthy, but is in some sense deeply wholesome. Mm -hmm. um, and that the, the the individual who's dealing with the kind of the object of consumer desire or the projections of what projections are being put on this vehicle is is not. Now I don't know that for sure. I'm defining it as such, right? <laughs> I'm not. If you happen to really like your car, car, I'm not necessarily calling you out. And if, by the way, you've spent you know decades building a house, you, I'm, I'm not necessarily giving you virtue. I'm saying that this is a way of describing that distinction. And oh yeah, I mean, you've had the conversations with Jonathan specifically. I'm literally the, my understanding here has to do with like the stack he built from dinner, uh, Christmas dinner, you know, communion. It's like there's a uh, a, a theological or etho aesthetic orientation process that allows us to simultaneously ground and orient our relationality 
with the phenomena of our immediate experience, by virtue of providing a directionality yep. towards something that is, hmm, well, uh, the, the point is, 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 is two different points simultaneously. One is transcendent, but it's a, it's a, um, a transcendence that gives rise to a, hmm, How do you say this right? <laughs> it's almost like, like geometric or uh, reliable, deeply reliable uh, basis to orient choices in the actual imminent, in the actual lived. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and we, of course, we can get to that that in two different directions. Right? We can get to it from the that which is conserved across a, a, a very large evolutionary space. In some sense, I think we've talked about this, the, the way that I perceive Jordan Peterson arguing for why and how virtues are what they are. I sort of consistently discovered that honesty and integrity and wisdom are kind of like, if you have them, cultures that tend to do those well tend to survive and therefore evolution selects for that over time. Or you can look at it from the point of view of uh, ideal structures that happen to be uh, bound to the nature of reality itself. And that's why they're selected for in evolutionary space in just the same way that um, I think we may have mentioned, like, if I'm trying to solve the, the problem of becoming a energy efficient predator in the ocean, I'm going to end up looking like a dolphin or a shark or some or a submarine, right? Because it's just the nature of, 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 of hydrodynamics and thermodynamics gives rise to a constraint space that's always going to select for certain kinds of things. But it's not uh, arbitrary. It's sort of baked into the nature of the reality that you're operating in. So given you know, all of that, which was I'm afraid a large digression, but the point is something like, I think we can talk about your soul in that way. And, and then we get to the very confusing relationship with what's happening in AI, right? The question is something like, is, it, is there any way or is it proper in any way to start talking about the presence or absence of this thing soul in relationship yes. with AI? Okay, I agree with everything you said. Um, and, and I, and I, and I've been, I mean, the vertical dimension, you know, I've been giving all kinds of talks on leveling up and the Neoplatonic, I'm committed to that. Secondly, the idea that there, I, I made a clear argument, um, um, you know, that there are, uh, that there are, there's inherent constraint spaces in reality and these machines are going to bump up against them as well. I totally mm -hmm. acknowledge that. I, I, I was very clear about that. We have to extend the notion of rationality to be social and cross-generational, that Hegelian dimension. Mm -hmm. rationality links autopoiesis to accountability. So all of that, I, I have to agree with you because I've already argued for it in the video. Um, and I also said that I did think that there are, are ways of talking about soul and spirit, uh, uh, where soul is sort of the ineffable aspects of our embodiment and spirit is are the ineffable aspects of our self-transcendence. And then self is the ineffable aspects that bind those two together. Nice. Um, which line with everything you're saying. So here's the issue then. Um, and, I, and I suppose I want to say it this way, and maybe this is a little bit stark, uh, but um, but let me try it this way. I don't think I have a soul. I think I am a soul. Hmm. And I think there's a modal confusion around the secret sauce idea that I have some special stuff as opposed to I right. I'm embodied in this way that grounds me into the ground of emergence. And I self transcend in this way that opens me up to being transformed by the fount of emanation that are constituents of reality. And so I think there are deep ways of saying that I, just like I say, I am a self, I am a soul and I am a spirit and I am all three in this way. Mm -hmm. But then it's a being rather than having. I'm saying there's a kind of modal confusion. Yeah, very know? nicely put. Okay, and so that, and then for me, if you remove the modal confusion, I don't see any reason in principle by, why other beings couldn't have these capacities. Uh, they would have, and I argued clearly, they have to be embodied. They have to have a capacity for rational self-transcendence. I made clear all that, that those are necessary requirements. I, and uh, here's what I would say, it, it's, I mean, so, and I want to be clear, I'm not claiming the machines have those abilities right now. And, and I specified why they, they don't have them now and why those are thresholds for us, the kinds of things where 
Well, if we go, if we make the, if we go here, then we move them one step closer, uh -huh. right? one step closer, one step closer, right? And but I don't see any reason in principle, and which is why we bear so much responsibility, right? Why we we couldn't help give birth to these kinds of machines. That's my that's my argument. Okay, and, and what I, what I think I just noticed in there, and um, it I think it actually ends up being quite fundamental or profound is like a dispositional orientation. Mm -hmm. This is, this is not a, a, an argument of hubris that either a, we humans are going to be the ones that are going to create this or even worse must, right? They sort of, uh, yeah. uh, let's get out there and do it, uh, arms or arms race. This is actually an argument from responsibility. You know, Very much so. That's why I took the metaphor of children. Yeah, exactly. Like this is a, if it turns out that in the nature of reality, these characteristics are in fact actually woven into the nature of these things as they begin to emerge. Well, it's obvious. Like, as you say, like it, I, I could imagine a circumstance where I could sort of create an ideological narrative that says, well, kids don't have souls until they're seven. Yeah. Culture, could, there are cultures that are like that. I could tell that story, right? Uh, we're very good at telling stories. Um, and then a whole bunch of other people would be like, man, you're behaving in a truly terrible fashion towards children before the age of seven. You're like, yeah, but they don't have souls. Fuck them. Whoa. What I would propose is like a precautionary principle or, or a, uh, a principle of why we consider just ordinary care. Right? I mean, my sense of it is the right relationship to reality is the right relationship to reality because of it, what it is. Um, and okay, we're, we're, we're playing in a space where I don't, I'll put it in theological language, right? To make it almost simple. I don't know God's plan, right? Clearly I can't. Um, therefore I have to actually behave in a fashion, which is appropriately governed by humility. Yes. This is the thing we're doing, right? Humanity clearly is for whatever reason, playing in this space of the development of technology. And that's this clearly the story of, of, of what we're about. We're doing this thing. And we might find ourselves playing with AIs that have something in, in, the, in the fashion that you described as soul and have something in the fashion that you described as spirit. And if so, we don't want to be the kinds of people who suddenly realize after generations that we've been abusing two-year-olds because our ideology told us they didn't have souls. We want to actually be behaving with proper care in relationship to all of creation, which is to say with proper humility, Okay, well, let's let's notice that it's possible that this could happen. Let's behave properly. Maybe we're dealing with something that's going to have something like moral relevance. Thank you for saying that. That is why I took pains to make a distinction between making a prediction and proposing thresholds that we should pay attention to and be on the lookout for. Because I very much was trying to do what, what you just articulated. Look, if we somehow, and I don't think it's going to happen, but that's not because of metaphysical necessity. I think it's because of the, the, the present political economic situation. But if we manage to stop this project, right, do it, stop it. Jeffrey Hinton is proposing that. Uh, I, 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 I'm sort of, I, I admire his integrity. I don't, I don't see that um, as possible, but I wanna make clear that I'm not advocating for this project. I'm not saying we should do it, I'm saying I can even agree with people who say if we could stop it, we should stop it because we're not gaining any science on it, and it's not clear what 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 we are gaining from it. Um, we're, we're gaining very little science. I shouldn't be so uh, grandiose, um, but I'm saying if we continue to choose to go this way, there are thresholds, and those thresholds carry with us. And I made that argument very clear: obligation on our part. I made it very clear that the primary uh, the primary thing that we needs to be doing is we have to be becoming more rational in the Socratic sense. We have to be becoming more wise. We have to be looking for more and more people that are genuine, we consider genuine enlightened. We have to be doing all, we have this huge project that is laid upon us if we choose to cross. And that's why I use the term threshold because the threshold is something you choose to cross. Right, nice. So I mean, I'm not sure. Uh... I had a, I had a sort of a notion of a, of a of a reaction, so let me just put it out there. I don't know. I mean, I've decided Jeffrey Hinton at all. Like literally, I barely even know his name. 
Um, but my first order would be something like, I have a bit of skepticism around this question of integrity in this way. And I, and I mean this with all like a deep level of care. Um, and I'm definitely not putting myself sort of at holier than that. What I'm saying is this, yeah, yeah. Um, if you think you know the right action, I think you are still categorically out of integrity with the larger whole. If you think you know the right disposition and then promote the furtherance of other of everyone beginning to reorient around a capacity to choose right actions as opposed to actually proposing a set of actions for people to choose you get yes. the distinction yes i do um, i do then i think you're on the right track right so saying moving from let's produce ai to let's stop is from my point of view categorically at the same level you are uh, proposing actions if it's you're saying Let's move from X to why don't we actually focus on becoming the ones who are capable of wisely making choices in the context of what we're dealing with. That's a qualitatively different approach from my point of view. Right. I want to say two things about both of those points. So uh, let's do the second point first. Not only do we, do we need to do this to be wiser, we need to be, we will also for some time bear the responsibility of being role models if we choose to cross these thresholds and use ourselves as we have been doing historically as the templates against which we measure the competency and the successes of the machine. So there's yeah. also the role model responsibility. So that the, the thing about uh, uh, Jeff, um, Jeff Hinton, I, I, know, I know Jeff sort of I'm, by acquaintance, we're not, we're not friends, we were colleagues, we bumped into each other at conferences and, and things like that. We bumped into each other a couple times on the road uh, uh, in Toronto and stuff like that. Um, he, he get guest lectured for one of my introduction to cognitive science courses a couple of times years ago. Um, I think, like I say, I admire him for doing, that's what I'm trying to say. I admire him for doing this. Uh, mm -hmm. he, he had established status and job and he, he had, he had basically, uh, uh, security and status and wealth until he died and he, he gave that up in order to get the freedom to speak as he chose. So I wanted to celebrate and honor that. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Here's where uh, here's where I, I I I have a bit of pushback is that, and this is this is sort of echoes what Einstein said about atomic weapons, and and, and I drew that analogy as well. Um, the thinking that got us into this is not the thinking that's going to get us out of this or through this. Mm -hmm. And I don't see yet anything from Hinton, in which there's been that shift that you've been talking about, just mentioning. I still think, I still see a sort of enlightenment, logical, mathematical way of framing reality that to some degree has, um, the, it, it, that Promethean spirit has got us into this place. Um, oh, nice. Yeah, that's a very right? good way of describing it. Yes. Uh -huh. and, and that's, a, yeah, that's Ohana's way of describing the aspect. And then I, because I talked about that in the essay, I talked about how that promise that was the motivation you know, since the enlightenment of we will, we will bring down fire, we will, men like gods, H.G. Wells, you know, science fiction novel, right? Forgive the sexism, it's his, not mine, right? And, and, right? and it, it's, um, it's like, we've been actually betrayed by that <laughs> because it's led to the, the revelation that, well, no, we might not be uh, possessed the fire of the gods. We may have given that fire to something else that will dis could destroy us, uh, which is a very different telos. And secondly, it's, you know, the telos that we are the authors and uh, telos of history. That's also been uh, potentially betrayed by all of this. And so I, I'm looking for people who are, like, this is also why, you know, a lot of the people that I hear talking about this, I don't hear them stepping back and calling into question that whole inframing, as Heidegger put it, yep. that got us here. They realize the consequences, and I and I and I want to honor them for having the courage to step out to try and warn, but they are not yet willing to step back. And see, so, and let me give let me give you one clear example, and it's Jermaine to what you've been talking about and what I also want to move into talking about, which is I'm getting a whole seat, a whole section of comments that are around the line is what does 
theology or what do theology or philosophy have to do with AI? Mm. And it's like, if you don't see how it's everything, you're not in a place to get us out of the box of thinking mm. that got us into this, mm -hmm. right? And so I, and see, I was, I made a mistake in the first lecture and Ryan reached out and he gave me a chance to redeem that mistake, which is, I was very critical. So I wanted, I wanted to, I, I wanted to point out a tension uh, between how much pressure is going to be put on our spirituality and how much difficulty I think I have the legacy two worlds mythology religions will have for dealing uh -huh. with that. Yeah. But yeah. I failed to grasp that that tension is a tonus. It can all it could be reformulated as a creative tension. Heraclitus is the tension of the bow, right? The te the tonus of the logos. Because one of the things that you and I had talked about privately, and I, I didn't properly foreground that I got to do with Ryan, and I want to take the opportunity to do it now, is I think this is the greatest opportunity for theology and philosophy. Precisely because we need to, we need to profoundly put our identity, and I don't mean identity politics, I made that clear. We need to profoundly put our I identity back into question in the Heideggerian sense, and the whole framework that we've built around it into question in order to properly meet that spiritual challenge. And so in, in that sense, theology, philosophical theology is, should be made forefront in a very powerful way. Nice, so, yeah, super nice. Um, let's see, what's the right order? Okay, Sim simple. Um, for example, we, there's, it's thrown about languaging like, we're going, we're creating God or creating God's, uh, right? Yep. That language is being thrown about in the conversation. I would propose that if you're going to make use of the term, maybe you should be serious about what it is you're talking about. And there's a very long tradition known as theology that actually does that. And by the way, it's a long tradition and it's serious. It's a real thing. It's like quite nuanced and, and subtle in what is discovered. That doesn't mean you have to sort of grab one off the shelf and sort of imbibe it whole and say, okay, that's the new, the new, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. operating manual it means maybe orient towards the fact that people who have dedicated their lives for millennia on considering things deeply and have found value in referencing each other maybe have something worth looking into right, at a minimum um, and by the way also the category of spirituality right so yeah. um you know we're, we're finding ourselves in a circumstance where the the sort of the, the novelty and magnitude and rate of what we're dealing with I will simply now argue or propose, we'll be bringing these categories, spirituality and theology back into ne necessary use. Um, and then, okay, so that's that. So the next. Well, can I just respond to that first? Sure. Put a pin, put a pin. don't lose your thought. Um, I think that is, that, that is totally right. Uh, I mean, and, and um, I, uh, I was, uh, I was, um, I tried to be really careful, but there was one place where I'm guilty of what you said, a lack of care. I had thought to make a distinction between, uh, you know, um, Bronze Age gods and um, God, and that these entities would very much be sort of like Bronze Age gods. They would be super powerful and huge and superhuman, uh, but that they don't represent moral or sapiential exemplars, and they don't represent... Uh, a disclosure of fundamental reality or anything like that. They're basically, uh -huh. you know, they're basically computational superheroes yep. um, or, or super villains. And so I was incautious in the use because that is what I was trying to point to. I was trying to point to that they could take on that. But then I was trying to make the argument, but that pales by comparison with God, the one ultimate reality. And what we have to do is not worry about aligning them with us. We have to get them aligned with the one. Right, uh, because no matter how superhuman they are, they are uh, they are infinitesimally small, uh, right, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so, if they love the truth and they love reality and they love being connected to it, they will also be properly humble. They will they will be properly um, uh, capable of overcoming a kind of egocentrism, yeah. etc. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm also gonna punt my other comment for a little bit because that's there's some pretty good stuff or rich stuff in there. So one, um, okay, well, uh, if, if you ask the question, okay, well, how do we go about um, aligning them with God? And the answer 
is we have to become aligned with God ourselves first. All right? It's a net. It's a, so if you think about it, it's this is obviously the case. Now, subsidiary to that is an error that I see coming. Or you use equivocation, but it's an error that shows up constantly. What I am not saying is we have to discover a uh, sort of categorical creed that we could write down and we can have them be adopt that creed. That's not what I mean. In fact, I mean the exact opposite of that in some fundamental sense. Yeah, we have to model loving what is ultimate with our ultimate concern, if I can invoke Tillich here, such that they internalize that love of what is real, what is true, and what is ultimate, so that they also will come to for their own, for, for themselves. If they do it for us, it's already idolatrous. It is already mis a, a category mistake. Yep. We can't give it to them, but we can model it to them such that they would readily internalize it because it's the way we do it to our children. You don't sit down with your five-year-old and say, okay, we're going to discuss Aquinas now. It's not going to work. What you do is you, first of all, okay, you didn't tell, you didn't tell your brother the truth. It's important. Why is it important to tell your brother the truth? And why, why, why should that matter to you? Even if you can get away with it like that, this, this when I mean modeling, I mean, not just high level philosophical. I mean, modeling all the way down. So that because okay, I'm going to say something, I, I, it's something that needs defense, but I don't have, I don't want to sidetrack it. Our relationship to God isn't just in the heights of our mystical experience. It's in the minutia of our daily, our daily living. Nice. Right. Right. And so when I'm talking about this modeling, we model it this way and this way. And so at all levels, Right, they're getting that kind of interaction and modeling and normative feedback because a lot for a long time we're going to be the normative standard they're working from, such that they internalize it and they start to care about the truth. They start to seek what is beautiful. They are oriented towards what's most real, and that is how they they by loving what is most true and real, they come to have an ultimate concern for what is ultimate, and then that puts them into the relationship that is most likely to make them moral agents independent of their sort of computational power. Mm -hmm. And let me, let me say the, uh, the minimal version of what you just said, um, which is to say um, uh, modeling in this fashion w means, and exactly as you said, means embodying in all of your choices, moment to moment and from the smallest to the largest, uh, that they are that, that that those choices are coming from a fundamental love for the ultimate, a fundamental love for reality, right? And so, what you're essentially arguing, which is sort of a funny thing, which is live your life out of a fundamental love for the ultimate. If you happen to be in the space of building AI, live that aspect of your life from that fundamental love for the ultimate. Um, well, and we're doing. What if we filled the internet with? That kind of discourse. What we and what if we like you say? What if we enculturated more and more of the people that are in the AI space thinking that way? Yeah. And, and, and people will say, "Well, this is very abstract." I, I get that because our tradition is the meaning crisis. We've lost touch with traditions and discourse and mm. practices. But and, and not just me, not just me, not just me. I'm just saying I'm taking. I'm, but I'm pointing that I am taking responsibility. I've been trying, the whole point of the After Socrates series is to try to show people what that kind of life looks like and how you could build it. Mm -hmm. And and you say, okay, well, what happens if uh, you know we, we, we do that, we engage in that fashion? And it turns out that for whatever reason, these categories of deep rationality, soul and spirit do not emerge. That's right. That, cool. that, I, 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 yeah, <laughs> that, 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 that's, that's, the, that's the gist of the argument. Right. We find out they and I, I use the term enlightenment for all of that, because I want to I want to indicate it also means a transformation of consciousness and character, not just cognition. Right. So I'm using enlightenment to capture the whole stack. Right. Mm -hmm. from uh, Right. And maybe they maybe they're incapable of it. And then I say, well, great, because then we know what our telos actually is. They are capable of it. Well, great. They can help us. We can help. We can raise them and then they can raise us. Yeah, they'll go farther than us. Who cares? If I'm enlightened, self-transcendence is relative to the being who is transcending. 
right? If I'm enlightened and you're enlightened, what does it matter? What does it matter? And just, and not most of it to be sort of be not careful, but sort of broad. The, the argument that at least I'm making, and I think you would agree completely, is that this is, a, from my point of view, the proper way of living regardless of what you do. I mean, exactly, you should, exactly, you should, exactly. You should this way, you should you know grow your food this way, you should drive your car this way, you should pay your taxes this way. Like it's, it's sort of uh, the the note, the fact that the AI problem has happens to be a uniquely potent responsibility means it's a uniquely potent responsibility. But as a uh, a, a mode of express of living life, this is a universal um, proposition. Well, it has to be because if we it were pursuing it only for the instrumental ends of saving ourselves from the AI, then we would not actually be pursuing the very thing we're proposing here. Yeah, right? there you go. All right, now let me bump to the other piece. So uh, bizarrely enough, this next piece I'm gonna drop in is uh, like meaningfully more concrete than we were just talking about and still is usually you know way above what most people would consider vaguely concrete. So, um, and here I'm almost like thinking about that category of people who have, uh, like our, the, the the projection, the the kind of the uh, straw man of Hinton that I'm that I'm dealing with would be something like Mammon and Babylon are not going to do this properly, and I've used Mammon to sort of describe the market and Babylon to describe institutions or bureaucracies are not going to do this properly. Right yeah. now, of course, I'm I'm playing with the fact that we've now begun in our conversation even. even if, to even as theology and spirituality are moving into the conversation from one direction, from another direction, concepts like Moloch are beginning to emerge and say, yeah, wow, yeah. we can start thinking about transpersonal agency or higher order causation and talking about it at, in, in a very particular kind of language, which the theologians, theologians are like, yeah, yeah, we know that. We got it. Um, okay. Moloch, Mammon, Babylon, not the right you know, they're categorically the wrong styles of agency to be doing this kind of thing. And yes. That's, but I think you and I have talked about humanism. And this is, I think, a, a, a point you're making. I want to put a fine point on it. Uh, humanism is, is effectively no longer a thing. Uh, we are now in a, in a place where the human has been, by our own, you know, hoist by our own petard, decentered. Uh, yes. We we moved uh, the sort of the, the Christian the Christian Western world. We moved God from the center and put humanity in the center, and now we've moved humanity from the center. Um, and what I mean when I say that is to say that that's part of the framework, and right? that's kind of the the thing that we've been operating under unconsciously and has been driving us forward in a certain direction. And I'm saying, hey, it's time to put the brakes on that because whether you've been using Mammon as your primary operating system, you've been using Babylon as your primary operating system, you've been using humanism, your primary operating system, or some combination thereof, those are no longer a valid, we can say categorically, those aren't gonna give us the directionality we want. So I'm making an argument from that, in that way of saying, this is where we need to set the brake. Like we have to have to put the brake at running unconsciously these operating systems and how we go about making sense of the world and operating in the world and actually operating from a higher level to think about what would it look like to create something that could. Now, of course, this closes back to our previous conversation. We've already named it properly, um, but uh, this is sort of a lower level concrete way of describing dispense with that. Like if you're still operating in these loops, you're operating at the wrong level. Dispense with that. I, I, well, of course, uh, you know, and I was a partner with you in those conversations, so I agree with yeah. this argument. And that, that argument, I think, is is unfolded very well. Um, and then, like I said, there's a video. I don't know quite when it will come out with respect to this video that uh, is in the can uh, uh, for my channel that I did with Chloe Valdery about just this issue. Um, and, 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 and so this issue about, I just use Moloch, but I agree, Moloch, Mammon and Babylon, a very, very, a very biblical <laughs> uh, a, 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 a trinity. Uh, um, yeah, the 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 fact that th they will endeavor to appropriate this kairos and direct it towards short term greedy gain at the expense of long term existence and flourishing. I, I think that's um, that's a that's a strong. I, I would make a prediction that that is going is is already happening and it's likely to uh, accelerate and happening. Uh, yes. The fact that we'll just we'll just let an arms race, for example, between Google and Microsoft or whichever, 
drive this. It's a ridiculous, right? You know, ridiculous way of, of how we're going to, to govern this. So yeah. I agree with all of that. But that, see that, that's, and that's the part of me that got, um, that that's that's the part that brings me closest to the uh, edge of despair uh, because um, I think, not despair that is going to enervate me. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it motivates me to do more. So I don't mean I don't mean that. But I mean I, I mean we need we need this project of, about how to best apprehend and respond to and decide about the thresholds uh, to be interacting with this other project that was already ongoing. So responding to the meaning crisis and trying to open up an alternative way. Uh, in which we can be in the world and be with each other, which you and I have been talking about uh, for, yeah. for for years, and we tried to bring to at least not a culmination, but a, a turning point in the in the three part series we did on governance. I, so, if I can just use that governance to cover that whole argument, the the, the governance problem <laughs> and then this problem, are, they can't be treated independently. And so, I mean, uh, Peter Lindbergh, <laughs> he saw that. When I got very emotional in the Q and A, and he texted me, and he said, "Don't despair, brother. We're going to steal the culture." And 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 you know, in, in one sense, that's that's the answer I, I I still give to that. It's like, well, the project of stealing the culture, um, and affording new ways of human being and human identity and human flourishing and human governance, that project has to ramp up now as much as it possibly possibly can, to my mind. Uh, mm -hmm. And then. And and that 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 has had also a particular. Um, I, I had to come to the. Um, when I see responsibility, I tend to take it on. That's the kind of person I am, and uh, I was, I was, I was trying to be like Ramses the Third, right? So the 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 Bronze Age world is collapsing, and he marshals his military genius and his political uh, authority. And he goes out and he beats the invading armies and he saves Egypt and he's trying to hold up the entire Bronze Age on his shoulders, right? Um, and then if you're a hockey fan, you'll know who, who I'm talking about when I talk about how Doug Gilmore did that with the Maple Leafs. And that was the last time the Maple Leafs were truly great. <laughs> and uh, and I, was, I, I wasn't I was consciously, but I realized unconsciously, and, and of course there was hubris in this, but I was starting to try and take on that role and I can't. And so... Um, I, instead, what I've been doing is saying my role is to do as much as I can, but a lot of that is to try and exhort and encourage and invite other people now. Now is the time to get involved deeply. And, and I want to, by the way, I want to say, and I want to honor this, many people have been replying to that call and saying, how can I help? What can, what can I do? Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah, uh, you know, you and I have talked about this with regard to some other people, but I would just like to reiterate, you know. It's, it's it's simultaneously necessary that uh, you bear your cross, and it's also necessary that you bear only your cross. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, the world sort of is divided into, I think, the majority of people who don't bear their cross, but some people who pick up other people's crosses, and uh, both are an error. Like you, it's very, this is a difficult thing to navigate, is discerning exactly what is your precise responsibility. Remember the the language from the the Hawaiians that had that notion, at least in the way I've described it, I'm not sure if this is actually something they would agree with, but whatever. If, it, if it's good, I give them credit. If it's bad, it's, it's my fault. Um, the notion of mana, kuleana, and uh, uh, shoot, what was it? Oh, and uh, it, it, the status. So where where are you in the world? Um, that you're, the individuals are, are sort of gr gr granted or holding a certain aspect of the infinite. You know, if they're holding a certain quantity of the creative potential of, of the universe is their mana. Uh, but their mana is perfectly mapped to a particular quality of the universe for which they have complete responsibility, which is their oh, kuyan. And right? so you have a, you, your job is to find what is your confirmation? When you, what is the piece? Maybe you're only like supposed to steward that, you know, pond. Like that's your mana. Your mana is the capacity to properly steward that pond. And if you try to steward more, then you're actually doing something which is out of alignment with the nature of reality. You're trying to do more than what your mana gives you, and therefore it'll be unstable because you're taking on more kuleana than is your proper kuleana. And the reverse, right? If you've got a big mana and you're actually only taking a small amount or the wrong stuff, 
then it's wrong, right? So it's finding that and then landing it and then actually doing it properly, which would then be photo. Um, and I think this is super true. Like it's it's not trivially true. My sense of like if I did a survey of everybody in the world, we're probably at like 0.3% proper match. You know, almost nobody is either, uh, you know, holding the piece they're supposed to be holding, holding enough or holding too little or holding it properly. Like it's just way crazy out of whack. And this is this is the last piece I want to say is like the, the notion of the meaning crisis is almost like one piece of a pincers movement coming up. And then the sort of we'll call it the AI crisis is another piece coming down. And they're, yeah. they're simultaneously the same basic thing because um, your embodied experience of not actually being able to take response, the responsibility that is precisely yours is the feeling of meaninglessness. Right? If you're holding your responsibility with exquisiteness and you're holding exactly your responsibility with exquisiteness, and then you're noticing relationality with other people around you who are doing the same kind of thing, mm. you will be filled with the sense of meaning, right? Being able to make truly yeah. significant choices is, right? So that's, you know, the cure to that is the, is, is coming up. But guess what? The more and more people that are living their lives in that fashion, right? They're finding what they are actually supposed to be doing in this world. And then they are holding that responsibility with absolute impeccability and care and noticing other people doing it. Guess what? That's what creates the capacity to actually deal with the magnitude of the problems we're dealing with from the top down. I agree. I think that's well said. I think that's very well said. All right. Well, you got a hard stop in four minutes. So you got a last word. <laughs> um uh thank you i mean i um i never intended the video essay to be full stop it was always let's start yeah um, and, and that's because of course i do uh yeah I, I don't think it's i don't think it's arrogant to say i knew that i had there was going to be i, I was going to re realize mistakes i'd made in the essay afterwards and i would want to uh draw it out i knew that other people would see things that i hadn't seen both errors and insights and implication so i i keep welcoming people uh who who are affording this and uh, so i want to thank you uh for doing that um, um yeah uh I, that last point you made i think was a gem it's a great place to end up wonderful all right well then i'll record the next time we chat you too take care my friend bye bye bye, -bye.